I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I want to start a series, a very small series, of a handful of videos addressing some technology points that may be useful for expats or digital nomads who are looking at moving abroad or spending a large amount of time traveling and being abroad. Of course, those two things may have slightly different aspects. We're going to do our best to cover that. There's a few things that people may not think about when they're going to be traveling, and if you don't, don't come from a tech background, you may not have a good idea of how these things may apply or what options exist when you're getting out and being a full-time traveler. Of course, some of you have very specific technology needs, and that may be something that we can't help, but giving some general advice and some ideas you may not have thought of or some factors that you may not be aware exist could be pretty useful. So I want to start this series today. We're going to talk about what computers you should be considering buying for 2024. Of course, this will change very quickly, but we're going to do some future episodes that address some things like media in your home or for traveling and uh, video games as well, because all of these things have some important aspects when it comes to traveling to Nicaragua, to being a digital nomad, to being an expat. We're going to get to that right after the bump. People who've known me for any amount of time would be really shocked to learn that I use Mac computers most of the time as an expat. And there's some really good reasons for this. But the things that matter when you're traveling full time or living abroad or living in a place like Nicaragua, where you have a lot of heat, you want to reduce your total power consumption, those factors can contribute a lot to your decision making when, if you're, for example, living in the US or Canada, you're not traveling, you may have very different needs. And of course, even if you are traveling, you may have specific needs that I don't have. So I want to talk a little bit about this. When you're living abroad or traveling, some things that matter a lot more than you realize or may matter more than you realize are having really good battery life on a lot of devices because you may need to deal with not just moving from place to place, working from an airport or whatever, you may go long periods of time without the ability to charge devices, but also you may have to deal with places where you don't have a built-in power infrastructure protection system. Meaning, if you live in Texas, for example, when we lived there, we had lots of big batteries around our house because the power was not bad, but it wasn't perfect. And it's just a way that you protect your system. So if we were to lose power in the house, we'd have all kinds of systems to keep the power running. And we were really well prepared to go down the street to a cafe or something where they'd have a generator or some other alternative power supply because we live there. And just over time, you accumulate knowledge of what you can do. So we're used to that when we're stationary at home. And you probably are too, maybe even without realizing it. When you're traveling, you may not have that same infrastructure. You probably can't travel with big batteries. You may not know which places are good for when you do or do not have power. That's stuff that you generally accumulate knowledge of over time. And you may have places that have much less reliable power or differently reliable power. Here in Nicaragua, the way that power is unreliable, we could actually make do with very high power usage laptops that only get a few minutes on battery because most of our outages are seconds, about five to 10 seconds, some that are up to a minute. And then we get once over three or five minutes, about once every two or three months. And then big ones do happen from time to time. And I always go out and record episodes when those happen. So you guys hear about every single one. But we had two this past week, one happened while we were doing the live stream uh, a couple weeks ago, like I was literally talking and the lights go out. But of course, I have a good battery system. So the camera stayed on, the computer stayed on, the streaming deck stayed on, all of the networking equipment stayed on. So everybody watching the show just watched my room get dark. And because the, the Fuji is so good in low light, it, it just kept right on trucking. It actually looked quite good. So it actually ended up being a point of interest. And that was about 10, maybe 15 seconds. It's hard to say because I wasn't looking at things. And the lights didn't come back on automatically because they're, uh, they're DC powered studio lights. So they when they shut off, they don't come back on without manual intervention. But the air conditioning behind me went off and right back on, but I wasn't looking at it. So I don't know exactly, but it was maximum 15 seconds before I knew I had power again. But we were just amazed that everything kept working uh, because the camera was able to handle the dark so well. 
But that was a normal outage. We had that while we were on camera. So it was perfect that people got to see exactly what I mean, that the power went out for seconds. And I'm like, oh no, the power went out. Oh wait, we're still on? This is amazing. You guys can still see me. Everybody's like, yeah, it looks great. And then I'm like, oh, the power's back. It was so fast, but it was good to see how it works. Any computer could handle that. Anything that has a battery like a laptop, even the worst laptop battery is gonna make it for five to 10 seconds. I mean, that's just, that's great. You can ride out those little blips. And if that's all you need to do, great. But if you need to go longer, things like a MacBook Air can get up to 20 hours of battery time. That's absurd. We often use it for days at a time without recharging it and in even doing really powerful stuff like video editing that uses a lot of power. So depending on what you need to do, that could be a big deal. For a lot of people, that could be the only battery system you need. Have a really good uh, laptop and you're able to make calls and, and get messages and do your work and you have plenty of time to find out, is it gonna be a few seconds, a few minutes? Is it seem like it's gonna be an all day thing? Maybe we should head somewhere and find alternative power. You got time to make that decision. You have time to get through an entire work day, maybe two before you need to even make that decision. Not that we've ever had more than a partial workday outage here, but just in case, right? Or depending on where you go, it may be a real thing. And of course, when I lived in Texas, we had to deal with weeks of outages. When I lived in New York, weeks of outages. So you gotta be, you gotta think about those possibilities as well, but you can't just fix that with a battery. But having a laptop with a really good battery could solve a lot of problems that you may face depending on where you go. And having the flexibility to move from place to place all the time could be important. If you know you're only gonna move to one place and you know what your power is gonna be like and you live there for a long time, like I do here, well, we start to put in the big batteries and stuff and, and don't have the same problems to have to deal with. Now I can use a desktop with no battery built into it whatsoever and not have a problem. So those are just things to be considerate of uh, when, you're, when you're looking at that. Well, you don't necessarily know what your power is going to be like, especially if you don't live there for a while. And he, living here in Nicaragua, when we first got here, our power outages were very different than they are now. Oh, but I was gonna mention that the other night, uh, just a few days ago, we had an outage that was much closer to five minutes. It was really surprising. It wasn't quite five minutes, but I was sitting on the couch eating dinner and the power went out. It was complete darkness because of how late it was. And uh, we got stuck just sitting there waiting, but I kept eating and just finished my meal in the dark and the lights were back on and I was able to finish watching my show with the just a few minutes blip in the middle. But those kind of outages, a little bit of laptop battery could go a really long way. And of course that same stuff's going to apply in our future discussion of things like video game systems. Having video game systems that have built-in batteries could also do the same thing for that. Now, if you're, again, if you're gonna be, you know, living in a place, then all your TVs and you know you're gonna be there for a long time, put in some good batteries and, and use that mechanism either additionally or instead, great. So also, the batteries are just a minor point. You can get non-Mac computers with really good batteries. The thing that makes Mac specifically so good compared to most other types of computers is that I'm able to get very high, powerful machines because I do a lot of video editing, I do a lot of really demanding things, but they use very little power and generate very little heat. That means a few things. It means on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm using less electricity than other computer devices are. That means I pay less to do the same amount of work. And I remember when Macs were super expensive. 20 years ago and farther for a long time, right? Macs were an extreme premium over other types of computers. And so you would often be seen as being very premium or very uh, unwise with your money or just willing to throw money about to look impressive or whatever if you were using a Mac. And definitely when I got my first Mac ever to try one out, uh, first Mac of the modern era, I should say I owned plenty back when they were antiques. But in about 2003, when Dominic and I first got married and the new Mac minis came out, I ran out and bought one and decided to really give it a chance. And it was absolute garbage. Their power PC era was awful. The machines had no power. They were terrible to use. It was a complete joke. The degree to which it would lag behind all alternatives was staggering. Then they eventually replaced the PowerPC era and went into the Intel era and started making the Intel Macs. And that era was certainly an improvement. They were no longer unusable, but they were simply overpriced not very good machines that did not live up to the Windows or Linux world running on that same Intel hardware, yet they cost more. So they were still super expensive and not very good. But a few years ago, about four to five years ago at this point, uh, Apple started releasing their own silicon, as they like to say, Apple Silicon, or the M series processors, M1, M2, and now the M3, along with their Macs and Ultra variations or whatever. These are based on the chips that are in their iPhones and iPads, but more powerful, except for the really high-end ones, now they align, but much more powerful than their traditional ones. 
These chips are designed around giving much more power. It's a different architecture. It's a different design under the hood. They're more powerful while consuming a lot less power, a lot less electricity. That means for the same task, you're using less power and they lowered the price of their computers significantly. So while they're not the cheapest things you can get, for what they do, they often are the most cost effective. So for me, for example, a really good high-end desktop is a lot under $1,000. And for most people looking for a desktop, it could be as low as $599. That's not bad, but if you were looking at the Windows world, you could purchase one for about 350, but not with anywhere near the features or power of the 599 hardware from Apple. So it depends on your needs. If you just need the most minimum thing, you almost never turn it on, that could work out just fine for you. And you don't have to run Windows, you can put Linux on that $350 machine. And I'm just using B-Link's uh, SARE 5 model as an example, but that's a really good low cost, high quality example. And if you put Linux on it, you have a really robust machine with all kinds of power and it's gonna work really well. So you have an affordable option that's pretty good, but it doesn't have the performance in any way, shape or form as the Mac Mini for uh, 600, but that's almost double the money. However, the one uses an AMD processor. They're genuine AMD, not the Intel clones. The AMDs tend to get more power at lower cost. So that's if you're looking to be cost conscious, that's where you want to be within the, what they call Intel world or the AMD world. So those are pretty, they're really good to buy. I use them myself. I would totally recommend them if they fit your, your profile. But because they use more power every moment that they're on and generate more heat, that means that if you're running them regularly, and like me, I run my computers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's always something that needs to be rendering, uploading, downloading, storing, moving, monitoring, something. I never get a chance to turn them off and I use multiple on all the time. So it's really a problem if my computer draws more power than is absolutely necessary. That means that we would pay more to constantly suck that power. And as people noted, typically per kilowatt hour, Nicaragua costs more than the US. But as we point out, there's a lot of factors to that and that's not necessarily true, but assume it could be true. And depending on where you travel, it could certainly be very true that electricity costs more than you're used to and reducing it is important. So if you're reducing even five or $10 per month of electricity usage by having a more efficient computer, that could save you quite a bit of money over time. If that was $10 a month, which is given a relatively high amount of money, but if you were to save $10 per month, which is completely plausible with a computer that's $120 a year, if you keep that computer for three years, which is not long at all for modern computers, I've already had mine for four and I expect to have it for many more years, then it will have paid for the difference during that time from that alone while reducing the, the pull on the grid. So you're doing good things for the environment while also saving yourself money, while also having a more powerful computer for it. So you're getting a lot of benefits with really no downsides, unless you just really hate using Mac, which I totally get because it's still not a great operating system, but the hardware is fantastic. Uh, so it can actually end up being the cheaper option. And that's before we consider air conditioning. If you're in an environment where you need to air condition your room with a computer, which for a lot of people, even Nicaraguans, this is necessary because computers overheat. I need to get a computer for uh, my attorney here because in her office it's too warm and her traditional computer can't stay cool enough. She needs a new computer that just won't shut off from, the, from overheating. That's a real problem here that everybody faces. So to keep computers running, you often have to have them in an air conditioned room or do really special things or not drive them very hard, which is obviously not a very good solution. So having uh, uh, a computer that generates less heat in many situations means you'll run less air conditioning. And for every dollar that you're spending on that extra electricity, that's probably another 50 cents to $2, depending in extra air conditioning costs that you're going to generate to cool that computer down more because of the extra heat that it generated. So this is a doubling effect in situations where you're going to use air conditioning, but that is a large number of them. So for, especially for expats, if you're gonna have a home office, having it stay cooler and use less power is a really big deal. And then you have the whole battery thing where whether it's a, a desktop with an outside battery or a laptop with an internal battery, because you draw less power, even when the power's out, and of course you don't have air conditioning when the power's out, but you're depending on your batteries to last, you get more time from those batteries, the same batteries, because the equipment draws less power. So Mac is really good at this. You can also get some machines that are not quite as good, but pretty close uh, if you're going with like Chromebooks or Raspberry Pis, but not very many people find those to deliver the things that they want. But it is important for a lot of my audience, for a lot of expats, especially retirees, 
If you don't have a very specific need for needing Mac, Windows, or Linux, if you're able to do everything from a web browser. Now, if you're doing things like video editing, really heavy photo editing, there's a few specific tasks that absolutely require a traditional computer. But for most people, especially those that are moving abroad, especially expats, often digital nomads, but, but they kind of fall into a middle ground, the chances that you need traditional applications is very low. And if that is the case, having a Mac or Windows or traditional Linux all don't make sense for you. They're all gonna cost too much, be unnecessarily hard to maintain, and they're just not built for your use case. For me, I do Final Cut Pro for everything. If I wasn't using Final Cut Pro, I'd be using DaVinci Resolve. I use that all day long. I have to have a computer that can run that and run it really, really well. That means that Mac is the only hardware that is viable for me. It would cost me three to four times as much to purchase an Intel or AMD base machine that could do the same editing that I'm doing for less than $1,000 on the Apple Mac. So for me, for that work case, it is very, very specifically the Mac that wins every time. But if you're doing normal stuff, you're just going to websites, playing some online games, checking your email, doing normal things, what you want is a Chromebook. These are available from a number of vendors. High end, they typically don't go above about $600. On the low end, you can get them for like 120 to 150 if you look around for sales. And often those really cheap ones do just a fine job. They're very low power. Generally, they do vary. They're not, it's not like Mac where they're all the same, but you can find ones that have really good low power usage like the MacBooks. Um, they're very good at having vertical integration. They can shut off really well, go to sleep really well. They're much more uh, easy to use, way more secure than normal computers because they do less uh, and they often work extremely well. Very simple devices that just do what you need and nothing else. If you're going to be watching Netflix on them, you're going to be, uh, you know, talking to family and friends, you want to do Microsoft Teams or you need to do Zoom meetings, all those things work better in most cases on a Chromebook than on anything else because it's not trying to do anything it doesn't need to do. They basically made it the simplest possible device for exactly the tasks you need to do. And so for the majority of people, the majority, probably 80% of my audience should be really heavily considering any new investment to be Chromebooks and Chromebooks that are designed around having a good battery life with low power consumption, and that will give you a really low cost device that best handles your scenarios. And often they handle Wi-Fi excellent, they have really good support, and they're, they're just generally really cheap. <clears throat> So that is what I typically recommend for people who need more power, no matter how much you dislike it, Mac is probably the thing that makes sense. I hate that Mac is my answer, but I've had one now for years. I now have a Mac laptop as well. So I have two Mac devices and honestly, they work so well, so well. I can't get over how good they are and how bad they were just a few years before that, right? Like I totally recognize how terrible they were, but they absolutely changed every aspect of their computers because they recognized how bad they were and they fixed that. And now they are the leader. There is a reason, especially in hot environments, especially as a traveler, especially as someone who needs to do big editing and big memory intensive things, the Apple Macs are probably where you need to be. On the rare case that you need something else, then you're going to be in a special situation where you need specific software. That software is going to dictate your needs. As always, I would recommend Linux over Windows. I always keep a Linux laptop as a secondary device. I use Linux for a lot of things. There's times that I want to be able to go from Mac to Linux. Linux is still the best operating system out there. It just, you can't get the amazing Mac hardware for Linux. So it doesn't matter how much better Ubuntu or Fedora Linux are than Mac as an operating system the hardware dictates that I just can't afford to try to do the same kind of things uh, without the Mac hardware. So that's what I run. Um, those things I think are really good uh, factors that you should consider. Outside of that, it all comes down to what software you use. And for definitely, you know, get down in those comments. Let me know, because I work in technology, uh, what software do you think is causing you to need things? What actions make you think you need Windows or need a certain type of hardware? And some of you re will really have those requirements. Uh, but the majority of people who lean towards Windows, it's because of video games. And we're going to talk about why maybe that's not the way you want to go in a future episode. And it's not necessarily a reason to rule it out. But there are things that may make Windows as a traveler, as an expat, as a person who's out on the road and in these hot environments with all the same concerns may want to think about getting away from windows for that as well ask your questions leave your comments video comments are excellent i really enjoy that those are starting to be sent in i've had three people send them in at the time that i'm making this i'm really looking forward to more uh, i want to get you guys on the show as much as possible thanks for joining me like and subscribe 
Buy me a coffee if you would. That would be amazing at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Links are always on the screen, always in the description. All the information I hope about sending me the videos is down in the description. And I will see all of you tomorrow. And if you would be so kind to look at these four videos that are on the screen and pick one that piques your interest or just at random. And if you need to, just let it play in the background. It helps tell YouTube that you enjoy this show.